Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. In this week's video we are working on this Icelandic poppy flower painting. This is a bit of a fun tutorial because while the subject seems really complex, the techniques are simple and the color mixes are minimal. For this tutorial I am using Arches Rough 140 pound watercolor paper, M gram watercolors, and an assortment of smaller brushes between sizes 1 and 000. If you are curious about any of the materials that I am using in this video, please check the description box down below to find a more detailed list. Also in the description box is a link to my Patreon page. Here is where you will find extended tutorials, including one for this painting going up soon, as well as other watercolor and art related content. My Patreon tutorials include the reference images, pencil sketch, color mixes, and my tips, tricks, and techniques to completing the final painting. All of the Patreon tutorials are full length, real time tutorials, complete with a full voiceover as I talk about all of my techniques in depth. Now, this tutorial is not going to be part of my Perfect Trio Masterclass series, but it very easily could be. We are working with what is mostly quinacridone rose with a bit of yellow, and in my painting, I chose to work with a quinacridone violet, but you could very easily mix similar colors to what I used with your phthalo blue. Please don't feel like you can't complete this painting if you don't have the exact colors I used. Work with what you have and find out the colors or color mixes that you like to complete your own painting. It doesn't even have to be the same colors. To get started with this painting, I'm using a slightly larger brush with some very diluted paint to get some of the structure of the flower in place. I wanted to take this time to figure out how the petals are going to flow, establishing the directional pattern of the petals and some small variances in the color to help show shadow. I'm making sure to do this wet on dry, meaning I have not wet the paper prior to starting. Since I want all of the details in this flower to remain crisp, the entire painting is done wet on dry and I make sure to keep moving to allow areas to dry completely before continuing on with further glazes. This is a bit of a low pressure way to really get started with your painting because these light layers won't really be noticeable at the end of the painting. It's a time where you can make some mistakes because they can very easily be corrected or covered at this point but this should also be done carefully since these marks are what you will be following until the end. I like using smaller brushes for florals. I usually prefer a synthetic brush because I like the way it holds and disperses the paint and water. My usual brush size for the start of a painting like this is a number one. I'm not picky about these brushes. I'll even use some inexpensive brushes from multi-packs. A couple of brands that I do like are Princeton and Cotman. I've used both and they've held up well for me. The Princeton Velvet Touch brushes are some of the oldest in my collection and they're still holding up very well. With flowers, I like to get a feathered look with my brush strokes, so synthetic brushes are really amazing for this. I like to mix up a puddle of my paint mixture, making sure to get the consistency I like or close to it. It's better to mix up your paint to be a little bit thicker than you want rather than thinner. Remember that as you are rinsing off your brush and dipping into your paint, you're going to end up making it thinner over time anyway. Then I make sure to clean my brush really well. I know this will feel a little bit like wasting paint to some, but a better way to think about it is priming or prepping your materials. Having too much paint in your brush for this technique will cause much harsher lines and effects in your painting. To get the feathered or blended look in my paintings, I start with my brush and an area of my painting where I know the color is going to be the darkest. In many cases, this is at the very center of the flower. I want to get some of the paint out of my brush in this concentrated darker area to prevent puddling in other areas where I don't want it. This requires a bit of practice on your part to understand water control, both in your own brushes and in the space you are working with. Some of these techniques will vary slightly depending on your own brushes as well as the paper that you're using. Try to notice how your bristles look as you are painting, and you will start to notice the difference in the sheen that they have as you go. These bristles will be very glossy looking at first. And once you have some of the paint out of the brush, and the brush isn't as wet, the bristles will still look shiny, but much less so. At this point, I begin a flicking motion from the darker area where I've just put down my paint outwards towards my lighter areas. This creates the feathered or blended look that we want. Be careful not to go too far to keep those middle highlights. 
This is a technique that I recommend trying out on a scrap sheet of paper if you are unfamiliar with it. This is a technique that I use often and both water control and brushwork skills are needed for it. You need to get familiar with just using the tip of your brush for this technique and that can take some practice. I really recommend taking the time and getting used to your brushes, creating textures on your papers, and learning how to keep your lines steady and consistent with your brushes. I personally don't like relying on specialty brushes to get the look I want, instead I focus on the techniques I need to use. Most of this painting was done with very subtle changes in pink. Like I mentioned earlier, I used primarily quinacridone rose for this painting, and I think it's very easy to see that much of this painting is done with none or almost no color mixing at all. I played mostly with the dilutions of the paint to convey the lights and shadows in this painting, with very subtle mixes of yellow. I used my yellow to warm up my pink, creating a corally pink type colors, some warm oranges, glowy yellows, and some soft beigey type colors. I made sure throughout this painting to keep the center of the petals white or very light. I wanted these to be the highlights in the petals, so maintaining these highlights was very important to me. As you can see, I didn't use masking fluid or any other masking medium for this painting. It's really not common practice for me to use it anyway, I just don't love using it, but also, I wanted to softly blend into these white areas, and I felt like using masking fluid would create too harsh of a line in the delicate white areas of the flowers, and would create more work later on as I tried to blend it into the rest of the painting. In some of the darker areas of the flower, I did use a bit of quinacridone violet to create some of those shadows. I didn't rely on this color solely, nor did I only mix it with the pink. Instead, I mixed all three colors together to help create some depth within the shadows of this painting. I talked about this a little bit throughout my Perfect Trio Masterclass series and in my color wheel videos. I'll leave that linked if you are curious about how to neutralize your colors in paintings like this. I made sure to build up this depth gradually. I like to do some of the lighter colors first. This works as the basic painting structure as well as the highlights. Then I start working on the midtones before working on the darker areas and texture in the final layers of the painting. Some common areas that I added shadows to were where the individual petals overlapped, also in some of the folds in the individual flower petals, and finally in some of the shadow areas in the individual flower petals. Since these petals have a crinkled texture to them, I needed to make sure that I was conveying that with color. You may have noticed that in the beginning of the painting, I was really just focusing on the directional lines of the individual petals. This is a very common step for me, and I think it's important to lay the groundwork for the flower structure before starting to develop it further. This groundwork allows me to better map out the flow of the flower as a whole, as well as the individual petal shapes. From there, I started to put in dense areas of color where I knew the shadows would be and throughout the petals. Again, this was done in a very light glaze to try to map out these areas rather than fully developing it early on. I think laying out the groundwork for paintings is important to do early on. These early glazes are very light and are easy to lift or paint over if your original work isn't perfect. As you get further and further into the painting with your additional glazes, you are essentially enhancing this groundwork and developing it further. If the first few glazes aren't perfect, the subsequent ones can be better and they will be covering up any mistakes. Just remember that this early work should remain lighter. Think of watercolor as stained glass windows. The colors will continue to layer up and darken, but it may not be possible to completely cover over the first layer if it's too dark. Think of this as putting down a purple layer first and then trying to cover it up with yellow. You will never fully be able to cover up that dark purple layer, so try to do this in very light and gradual steps and work with colors that you know that you can cover over later if needed. As we get further into our painting, our colors are going to be getting darker, but also, depending on your own personal style, the brushes will be getting smaller as well. With subjects that are as delicate as this, there are lots of small details. You can choose to develop these areas as much or as little as you would like. It helps to understand how you will want your painting to be viewed. This is also up to your own personal style and preferences. Once we have developed the petals, it's time to start working on the center of the flower. This is a difficult part for me, only because it feels so daunting. 
I actually purchased some books secondhand online recently to help me better understand the flowers. If you are a patron of mine, subscribe to my newsletter, or follow me on Instagram, then you may have seen some of these books that I've purchased. These have been so valuable in helping me understand flowers better, as well as educate me on more flowers and their common names. I do think it's important to note that I'm not directly copying any of these images in these books, but rather using the detailed information in them to help me better my own drawings and paintings when needed. Since I felt pretty confident in my drawings, I didn't find this part of the painting to be all that difficult. I think the biggest hurdle is that there isn't much information to be conveyed in the lights and shadows, so some of them were exaggerated by me. This part of the flower is almost entirely yellow, and the first glaze in this area was very light and I covered the entire area. I did want to make sure to let the entire area dry before painting in more detail. Once dried, I used darker concentrations of my yellow to start adding in some depth. I also mixed a bit of my quinacridone violet in with my yellow to create some nice deep browns for shadow areas. I worked in a similar way than I did in the rest of the painting, but with smaller brushes. I did the same flicking motion carefully in a circular motion, keeping my individual lines straight. Then I added some smaller, darker areas around the circular stamen details to give the illusion of some depth and start to create some spatial differences between each of these individual shapes. I then went through and refined my painting as needed, working on some of the shadow areas and details as needed. I hope you all enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, I would love it if you would give this video a thumbs up, leave a comment down below, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and feel free to share this video with anyone who you think may find it helpful. If you like this tutorial and you would like to see a more in-depth version, or you would like to further support my channel, then please consider going over to my Patreon page. I'll have a full-length version of this tutorial up soon, and I have several other tutorials over there already. I hope you are all having a wonderful day, and I will see you all in the next video. Bye!